themes of this session have to be, first of all, what minerals were present on Earth during the origin of life, uh, what were the possible roles of those minerals, and what are some of the key physical chemical properties of the minerals that led to those roles. Now, there's a long history of papers about this, just to give you a sense of the variety of minerals people have talked about. There's, of course, classic work by Ayrton and Ferris on the role of clay minerals and uh, facilitating RNA oligomerization. Um, sulfide and oxide minerals have been used by a variety of workers to look at catalysis of small organic molecules. Uh, the work of Ricardo et al. on borate minerals, the stability of ribose is important, and some of our more recent work shows also surprising stabilization of amino acids in serpentinization reaction zones. And I'm very interested to hear later today, beyond these work, on the carbonate and sulfate minerals and how they absorb oligomeric RNA. Lots of different kinds of studies using different sorts of minerals. So we have to ask what minerals were present. And this all goes to our work in mineral evolution. We've been taking a big data approach recently, which involves first building data resources on minerals through time. We also have to use data analysis and visualization methods, which I'll show you. And finally, take this integrated approach, thinking about the co-evolution of the geosphere and biosphere. So the first part has to do with the data resources. There's lots of uh, different mineral species. Each mineral species is defined as having a unique combination of crystal structure and chemistry. There are about 5,200 known mineral species now, and the number is growing. Our databases are very, very important. For example, the rough database, which if you want to know all the different mineral species that are currently approved, if you want to sort by chemistry, for example, here are the carbon bearing minerals. We've also been building an evolution database. This has been a brute force effort for the last eight years by hand entering the ages and localities of different minerals for up to 120,000 data points. It's also very important to understand mineral localities. The crowdsourced data resource mindat.org has now listed something close to 300,000 localities. And in each of those localities, it lists the minerals. And there's something over a million mineral locality pairs now. So this is the kind of data resource we can work. It's certainly not big data in the sense of some other fields, but for mineralogy, we're finally getting to the point that we have enough data to do statistical analysis. And that then brings us to various ways of illustrating the, um, the kinds, visualizing the kinds of mineral evolution. One of the most basic things we can do is show the first appearance here of boron and beryllium minerals, work pioneered by Ed Brew. You can see the very first boron mineral appears about four billion years ago, tourmaline. The very first beryllium mineral about three billion years ago, that's beryl. And then you see the cumulative number of minerals. And one of the things to point out here is all indications are that early in Earth history, there were very relatively few mineral species. It takes a long time to process the near surface environment sufficiently to get these specialized minerals. Another way of showing this is by looking at individual mineral species. And certainly the pioneer here is zircon, zirconium silicate, which is so robust and resistant that you can see there are now uh, hundreds of thousands of data points on the zircon ages. And what we see here also, going back in time, a billion, two billion, three billion, 3.5 billion, there are a few zircon crystals that even extend back to here. But you see very strong pulses of mineralization which are thought to be associated with a supercontinent cycle when you have collisional orogenies, when you basically are assembling supercontinents, you both preserve and, and manufacture more minerals. So there's both a preservational aspect here, but also an episodicity in mineralization, which I think is very important in thinking about early Earth, you know, when were there pulses of mineralization? One can now accumulate lots and lots of data. Here now are literally thousands of different minerals containing one or more of the first row transition elements, elements that are important in biology and certainly important economically. And what we see here going again through, through billions of years of Earth history, you see the number of mineral occurrences um, that are binned here, in this case 50 million year bins. Um, and there's a whole variety of, of trends that we can see here. One of the important ones is that indeed we see the largest pulses of mineralization associated with supercontinent assembly. Um, we also see a very large pulse in the last 50 million years because there's lots of ephemeral minerals 
uh, minerals that would dis disappear through erosion or just uh, being washed away by the last rainstorm. Um, we also see interesting periods where there's no mineralization, and I think this is a theme for Earth's history. Why this is true is not yet clear. Uh, some people suggest that plate tectonics stopped. That doesn't seem reasonable to me. There certainly seems to be um, a correlation with some proposed global glaciation events that's possible. And it also could just be the fact that in periods of supercontinent stability or breakup, there are fewer mineralization events, and that's reflected in what's preserved. We can see the same thing. This is now iron, only iron minerals through time. You see the supercontinent cycle reflected, but then this period of Rodinia assembly, which is very prominent in the Zircon record, simply doesn't occur in many, many other elements, and we're studying this right now, trying to understand why this particular supercontinent cycle seems to be very different from everything else. So there's a lot of, of details wrapped up in this kind of data. There's also information here on changing redox state, and clearly one of the most important aspects of mineral evolution has to do with Earth's changing near-surface environment as a result of photosynthesis and biology. You see we've colored this manganese minerals. Dark green is the plus two oxidation state. Light green is plus three, and then yellow is plus four. What you see is in the last uh, half billion years or so, a, a real uh, rise in the amount of manganese 3 plus and 4 plus minerals compared to the 2, two plus. So this is a very general trend we see. It once again points to the fact that early in Earth's history you're not going to have so many of those uh, really oxidized minerals. And we can show this kind of uh, data now graphically so we have lots of different techniques. There's a huge amount of information embedded in a diagram like this and it does give us indications of various trends that we can find. But we're interested now in exploring other visualization techniques, chord diagrams, skyline diagrams, other kinds of analytical approaches to looking at Earth's mineralogy through time. And what I want to introduce now, uh, rather briefly, is the idea of network analysis applied to mineralogy. Uh, in the next talk by Shona Morrison, she'll go into more details about exactly how we do this. But just to give you sort of visualization, uh, network analysis is used frequently to analyze social groups, for example, research collaboration networks. We can do the same thing, use the same kinds of patterns and see them in mineralogy. So for example, here's a paleobiology network showing animal families. Each point represents a different family of animals. What you'll see, here's the Cambrian fauna, and there's an extinction event. Then this is Paleozoic. Here's the Mesozoic, and there's another extinction event. And basically built into this is a timeline. Well, it's, it's really kind of cool that you can see that a timeline built into the network, even though we did not use time as a coordinate in building this network. Here's a rather more complicated 60,000 protein structures. This is the fold structure of a protein near the active site. And, and this work shows, once again, a change in chemistry of the active site, the metal used, and built into this appears to be a timeline of protein evolution. We're exploring this with our colleagues at Rutgers University right now. So now let's look at mineral networks. The same principle, each node represents a mineral species. If two minerals coexist, there's a link between them. You can make a network of minerals. Here's a very simple network just of the major rock forming minerals and igneous rocks. And so embedded in this network, there is granite, there's nepheline cyanide, olivine basalt, indeed all of igneous petrology is embedded in this diagram. You're seeing it in two dimensions, but there are about 36 different nodes here. So this is 35 dimensional space that's being projected down just to two dimensions here. There's a vast amount of information on phase relations and other very important uh, information. And then finally, here is a bipartite network, vastly more information. You can actually display 10 attributes, 10 dimensions of information in this two-dimensional kind of plot. You can also make this in three dimensions and higher dimensions for mathematical analysis. What we see here are colored nodes representing minerals. The size of the circle is how common the minerals are. So calcite, malachite are very common. Less common is the barium carbonate witherite, and there are many, many rare minerals. You also see colors here that also represent the abundance. And what you find here is a trend that we've discovered is very important in mineralogy. There are a few very common minerals, but they're only 
there, there are a few common ones and many, many rare ones, which is called a large number of rare event distribution. Here's the exact same diagram that's colored according to the age of the earliest occurrence. And this starts being relative, for example, to Bianchi's work where you're invoking carbonates as one of the phases. Indeed, some of the very earliest minerals are the common carbonates that occur at the core. If you look at the color pattern, what you're actually seeing, again, embedded in this network is an age, uh, is a time line, even though time was not included at all in calculating this network. In a bipartite network like this, by the way, the black represents localities and the colors represent mineral species and the links that are between localities and their species. There's a huge amount of information here. There's also some interesting symmetries. The bilateral symmetry is something that has not been seen in other kinds of bipartite network diagrams and it represents some very deep mathematical relationships in terms of mineral diversity and distribution. And one last step then, uh, Shona Morrison has been working on the copper minerals, and here we can now see a bipartite network just of copper minerals from the Archean that's older than 2.5 billion years. What you'll see here then are black locality nodes, and you'll see a concentration of the most abundant, primarily the reds and blues. The reds are sulfide minerals, which you see seem to dominate this particular diagram. Um, relatively few sulfate minerals in the early period. If we go now to the most recent 65 million years, you see, of course, more species, more localities represented. The localities form this distinctive U-shape. And in the core, the most common minerals, again, sulfides, but a whole bunch of sulfates also appearing here, and many, many rare sulfates and oxide-type minerals. So we can see trends in mineral evolution visually presented and can explore this in a much more detailed way. Uh, I wish I could show you how uh, dynamic these diagrams are because you can basically, in the work we do, you can click on any node, pull them around, and see what everything's linked to in a visual way. So, in conclusion, earlier mineralogy I think was very limited, perhaps even much less than the 420 minerals that I once predicted would be present in the Hedean. We see this also in the parsimony of mineralogy on the moon, on Mars, on other worlds. The relative roles of mineralization and erosional loss, though, may be biasing our results in a very significant way. And I think these large and growing data resources, this is really going to be the key to understanding uh, both the uh, earliest mineralogy in Earth and also the co-evolution of life and geology. So with that, I want to thank my collaborators in this uh, from six institutions and a Keck-sponsored project, particularly the early career people who have played a huge role in this, this work, and our various funding agencies, which are shown here. And I thank you very much. There might be time for a couple of questions.